Hello, everybody. We're just about ready to start. Okay. Thank you. You're very well behaved. Um, just to say, obviously, it's a bit of an unusual day today in many ways. Um, so I think people are still coming in. I understand the traffic's very bad. Um, so uh, please don't, don't be distracted. But we've asked that they come in through the back. But you will have people coming in, I think, for the first five minutes or so uh, from behind you and coming in. So um, just to worry about that. I have to do a little bit of housekeeping first of all, so please bear with me. I've got my script. So um, I think the most important thing that I have to do is direct you towards the fire exit, which uh, I spoke to one of my colleagues earlier on and said, it's over here, isn't it? And he pointed out to me that I was sending everybody in completely the wrong direction. And the fire exit is actually directly here, which takes you straight out of the building. So should the fire alarms go off, which I sincerely hope they don't, uh, this is the nearest exit for you to take you out. And the place where you need to gather is down by the coffee shop that's kind of down the bottom, just outside the front of the building. So please do head in that direction, should the worst thing happen. So just a couple of other things to point out. We have fire wardens on site, I'm one of them, um, who will assist in evacuation of the building. Um, fire wardens have also been trained to evacuate individuals using the nearest fire exits um, and down to the, the point where we gather. Um, if you discover a fire, I hope you don't, um, activate the fire alarm or, or contact any of the members of staff that you see here, which is myself and Sue, who will speak in a minute as well, so you'll be able to identify Sue. And most of you will come past my colleague Dave Turner, who was at the front when you came in. So Dave also uh, is one of our fire wardens. Uh, the security staff are first aid, uh, trained, and the nearest defibrillator is down on the lower ground floor near the reception area. Um, I think that's everything, other than to point out that this is a snow smoking building, which I'm sure everybody realises by now, anyway. And that's all of the housekeeping from me. So now I can move on to the nicer bits of this. Um, first of all, welcome. Uh, wonderful to see you all, and thank you so much for coming. It, it's a particularly uh, warm welcome for you to come into this building. Some of you will be staff or students and be familiar with it, but many of you be, may be coming into this building for the first time. Is that correct? Somebody nodding me? Yes. Um, so I still refer to it as our new arts building, which is a, a bit incorrect since we've uh, been here for how long now? Three years? Two years? Two. Two years. Uh, obviously, during that period, all kinds of things have been happening, like a pandemic. So we're, in some ways, it still feels like uh, a new venue for us. But this is an extraordinary building, an investment of over £80 million pounds by Leeds Beckett University in Leeds School of Arts. Um, in our arts building, and we've got the most wonderful facilities here, including a theatre, all kinds of film studios, uh, sound recording studios, uh, performance space, and this lovely cinema. And as I am a film historian, this is a particularly beloved space for me. I remember coming in here for the first time and thinking, we've got a real cinema. It's absolutely wonderful. So it's delightful to be here, and delightful to see all of you. Now, I am going to introduce one of my colleagues uh, from music, Sue who is going to introduce our very special guest tonight, and it really is a special <laughs> guest. I'm very excited that Neil Brand is here with us, but Sue will introduce Neil. Thank you, Rob. Yes, welcome. So Neil Brand is the go-to person if you want to know how music works with film. So Neil Brand, there's so much to say. He's many things. He's a pianist, a performer, an educator. He's visiting professor of film improvisation at the Royal Academy of Music. He's a broadcaster, actor, dramatist. He's written a play called Stan about Stan Laurel uh, for the BBC Radio and TV. And he's also a film composer. And he has an international reputation as one of the leading exponents of silent film piano accompaniment. And it's the result of decades of performance work underpinned by his training in drama. Originally, he did a drama degree. Um, he's a deep, so he has a deep understanding of narrative in film. Um, he's also composed the first ever original brass band, band soundtrack for silent film, Echoes of the North, so particularly, I think, of interest here in Leeds. Um, and it's, yes, four chapters in time, a specially created film of rarely seen 20th century archive footage shot around the north of England between 1898 and 1929. And his extensive work, I think many of you are familiar with, uh, with the BBC and as, with, as a film composer, so um, he's composed uh, music for The Wrecker, Underground, Blackmail, Easy Street, and of course many of you will know him from Sound of Cinema, the music that made the movies, and also Sound of Song, where he analyzes uh, popular music 
and also uh, Sound of Musicals. I think uh, West Side Story is one that I watched, which is really close to my heart, uh, being a specialist in Latin music, um, and that was fantastic. So um, also, I was just having a tea break from marking, switched on the radio, and there he was talking about uh, music to screen to Ham House of Horror soundtracks the other week on, on BBC Radio 4. Um, so there's a perfect blend here of art, entertainment and education. So Neil is the all-round performer and educator. He can communicate complex musical information with a lightness of touch, wit and originality. So we're really delighted to have Neil Brand with us this evening. So put your hands together and welcome Neil Brand. Thank you, welcome. This talk is part and parcel of an ongoing research project of my own into what it is that manages to connect all of us to the sounds that come out of that screen. It's something that I first stumbled across really when I found to my surprise that I was a silent film pianist. In about the mid-1980s, when there wasn't much available in the way of silent film, and very few venues that actually wanted to show silent film, I was invited to play piano for Buster Keaton's Steamboat Mill Junior by the Eastbourne Film Society. I found out on that occasion that I could do this job, which is the job of sitting down at the piano, having a film start to unspool in front of you, and then begin to come up with the music for it. I'd always been able to play the piano by ear, and as Sue said, I studied drama. So I was looking straight away for subtext, even though I didn't know I was particularly looking for that at that stage. I went to the National Film Theatre and became one of their regular piano players of the late 1980s and still play there now. And I have probably played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies of all possible genres and all possible styles. And the one thing that's bound them all is that my job, as I see it, is to try and build a bridge between the age of the film and us. Now sometimes with some films that's harder than with others. There are movies which you probably couldn't rehabilitate in front of an audience now at all. But there are also the great timeless films, the films that don't change, the films that still tell us the same things now that they might have told us a hundred or more years ago. And so the music for those is doing the same job. And that's what I want to talk about here. I'll give you a little bit of the background to the history of how music works with film. And we will go back a short way into the, the annals. Although if you really want to see an in-depth history of how film music works, please do watch Sound of Cinema. I think it's on YouTube. So just grab it whenever you want. But as far as going into the nuts and bolts is concerned, Let's do the most obvious thing to begin with. I'll tell you a story, I'll show you the film from that story, and then I'll show you a couple of different ways that it could be interpreted. The one thing I'd ask you to bear in mind, and if you're musicians and if you're working with film, you already know this, is that music is information. If it's not, there's not a lot point in having it. Music tells you stuff. Do come on through, folks. And that's the most important thing that I want to try and put across. In 1915, an expedition was attempted to go to the Antarctic, run by Shackleton. He was a polar explorer. He'd been before, he'd been with Scott. And he wasn't trying to reach the South Pole, they'd already done that. He was trying to do something even more bonkers, which was to cross the landmass of the Antarctic from one side to the other. He even had another ship waiting for him on the other side. They put out depots of food so that once he got across past the South Pole, there was food waiting for him on the other side. He was in a ship called the Endurance. It never even made it to the landmass. It went into the ice field, was crushed by the ice over a period of about a year. Eventually they had to abandon it. They got off onto three boats, basically lifeboats, and rowed 200 miles to the nearest uninhabited island called Elephant Island. Then Shackleton and three other men rowed an extraordinary 700 miles to the nearest land 
uh, inhabited island anyway, which was South Georgia. The whaling station they were making for was on the north side of South Georgia. They landed on the south side of South Georgia, and so they had to cross the island, including ice all the way, climbing up to mountains that were of incredible height. And they made it. And the description of Shackleton being welcomed into a hut in the whaling station and saying, I'm Stay I am Shackleton, and them saying, We thought you were dead. And then whaling stations at that time were full of guys who were people who were trying to escape. It wasn't a nice job to do, it wasn't a good place to be. And yet for the rest of that night, all you could see were torches coming down the paths from all the different areas of the island to come and meet Ernest Shackleton. They gave him a boat, he sailed it to Elephant Island, he picked up all his crew, none of them died. Now that is an extraordinary enough story. The really extraordinary thing is they had a filmmaker on board, and he shot the footage of the ship going under. So Hamish, if we can have the first clip, please. This is from a film called South, which I was privileged to get to score for the BFI this year. It shouldn't exist. The reason it exists was because Shackleton was trying to raise money for the next expedition. And when they had to get as much off the ship as they could and get it into small boats, Hurley, the man who'd made this film, said, I can't take the film with me, it'll weigh down too much. And Shackleton said, yes, you can, you bring it with you. Don't bring the cameras, just bring the film cans. So what we have here is Hurley shooting his ride home, disappearing under the ice. That is the endurance. The blue lines down either side of that image are the effect of sub-zero temperatures on the film as it goes through the camera. The morning after the ship was abandoned with her forecastle head three feet beneath the surface, she would have sunk completely, but for the fact that her sides were pierced by huge tongues of ice which held her up. To have shot this anyway is amazing. And for us to be able to see something so immediate and so stark is inspiring. We could just play what we see, the last of the endurance. As the, the ice closes on it, <coughs> it disappears into the 11,000 foot depths of the Weddell Sea, which for four long months had sought her destruction. They found the ship this year as well. So what is the first thing that hits one as a composer with this? Well, I'd suggest Isolation, that whiteness, there's no horizon. The ship <coughs> is actually crumbling in real time. That wreck, as it gets hofted over to one side, all those masts are going to come down. And how you establish a connection between us and it has to take on board what we're watching, what we know of the story. What we think of as the music that will fit. Now, I'm not going into any detail about whether that should be classical or electronic or what it is. All I'm trying to do is find music that's got a message to it. Okay, can we start that clip again, please, Hamish? So what we're playing there is sort of what you can see. Minor key as well, and I'm leaving lots of space around these notes so that it rings, so that it suggests breadth and depth. But if I was to put a tune to this, and let's say it's a minor key tune. I'm 
compressing this music onto these images. It's not like the images are throwing up this music themselves. This is planned. And who knows, maybe that was the music they played at the time. But if I was to change the nature of that tune completely, let's go to a major key and see what happens then. stage further and make it into an adventure film in which we are 100% behind them trying to escape from this horrendous fate, we can actually bring up the tempo, keep it major key and turn it into something completely different again. Suddenly we're into a whole different genre of film. Same clip, same piece, but we are now in a world in which we are having our reactions to it completely influenced by the music. It's been the same clip throughout. But in one clip they're going to die, in the next clip they're not going to die, in the next clip they're not just not going to die, they're led by you know, Van Damme. It's, it's a whole other piece of work. And we're very used to that as an audience. We are hugely sophisticated receptors for music. We've all grown up with it. My son, who's 14, has seen so much film, so much TV, heard so much music, that these basic messages that we can take on board are really quite sophisticated. I can't tell you where we have grown this instinctive response to film music. I can make a guess. I think Noam Chomsky is not far off the mark when he talks about basic structures that we're born with that may have grown up with the human being as part and parcel of our DNA. Those structures recognize, for instance, the structure of, the, of a society, where one is within that society. Structures of language, how we talk to each other. Maybe our ability to receive music and to understand it at a very, very deep level is part of that basic structure. But it's not just good, bad, black, white, yes, no, that we, re we understand. We understand something actually fundamentally much more interesting than that. Emotions. There's some way in which music will tell us in a scene that a person is jealous. Now, that's quite a difficult emotion to try and describe under any circumstances, except possibly in a novel. But somehow or other, music perfectly, show, perfectly made and perfectly used will do that. So I want to show you a clip now from a movie that I got to school called Underground. This was a film made by Anthony Asquith in London in the 1920s. It's a drama, an absolutely fabulous drama. And Asquith, being the son of the Prime Minister Asquith, 
had some fantastically good contacts and was able to get the London Underground to let him film there for 11 nights in Waterloo Station. And so everybody you see in this scene, and you can let it go please, Hamish, if you would, is an extra. And here we are at the bottom of the escalator, looking up towards, I should imagine, the South Bank exit at Waterloo, if you happen to use that tube line. And it's very workaday. It's your average London crowd. They're going up during the tube. As part and parcel of the film Underground, this comes in about 10 minutes into the movie. We've met two of our characters, who are a young girl, very, very pretty, and a bloke who has made a really terrible job of trying to chat her up. And we're going to go down these stairs, and we're going to meet our third character, who's this lad here in the uniform. He also, as it turns out, likes the girl, and he also knows the guy who has been as it were, pestering her on the train. So here she comes, this bloke's still looking around, our man recognises the situation, sums it up straight there and then, trips him over, bang, <laughs> stops him going after the girl. Sorry, Bert, let me dust you down. And there's a bit of, yeah, there we go. So, you can just pause it there for me, Hamish, please. That, as a dramatic meet-cute, nicely done, you've got to suggest size, you've got to suggest bustle, you've got to suggest that character, you've got to have music going there which gives us all those different uh, elements to it. But there was something else that I wanted to try and put into the film. The underground itself becomes a character in underground. It's like a magical space where anything can happen. There is the most superb romantic tryst later on in the film, which only happens because they happen to have been left at the bottom of a staircase and the lifts aren't working. Now that makes it a special place. So rather than just saying, here's an escalator, here's a workaday morning or evening when people are using the tube, I was trying to say, this is a place where anything could happen. So if I can start the clip again, please, Hamish, with the sound up, and you'll get some idea of what I mean. magical encounter. She realizes she's dropped a glove. He sees the glove.
So it may be in the least romantic place you can imagine, but it's now a rom-com. It stays that way until it turns into a murder mystery and ultimately a psychopathic killer. <laughs> I cannot recommend this film too highly, folks. Rush out and get it, and it won't do my royalties any harm either. <laughs> but that's the point about music. It should be transformative. It should be telling us stuff we can't see. And I know that sounds basic, but it's true. There's an awful lot of music written that just tells us what we're already seeing. What about that? sidelong look. What about that stuff that comes in from left field? Nowadays, thank God, there are new film composers working with film who are past masters at taking you by surprise. But then that's not surprising, really, because we've all grown up with so much music that's on the nose. The music that comes out of nowhere, that gives you a sort of a new insight, that is fantastic when it happens. I want to show you a little bit from The Sound of Cinema because it's dealing with the, one of the all-time greats of film composing, Bernard Herrmann. But it's a very specific element of what Herrmann's doing. This is Vertigo. Still, for me, one of the greatest scores ever written, one of the greatest films ever made. But what Bernard Herrmann is given the job of doing within the sequence that I want to look at is twofold. He has got to make us feel something that's not there, and he's got to stop us feeling something that's about to happen. Now, both those things are part and parcel of the scene. And one thing about Herman that possibly people don't take onto account necessarily is that he's a miniaturist. Bernard Herman has tiny ideas that he then can extend. You think of something like Psycho, obviously, it's a massive sound, but actually, the general sort of gist of what Herman's after starts as very, very small ideas. <laughs> Vertigo itself, the actual tune of Vertigo, I think is the whole film is summed up in its, in its opening chords. <laughs> One lack of resolution, one resolution. Resolution and lack of it is one of the prime tools in any film composer's box. This is something that allows you to keep an audience hooked, to keep them guessing. All the time you don't resolve. Still a question mark there. The music's still got somewhere to go. We want to know where it's going to go. If you want to reduce it to basics, Vertigo is about mystery and romance. It's about the unresolved and the resolved. It's about James Stewart trying to resolve something that simply will not resolve. And Bernard Herrmann is a past master at not resolving. Just in case, I'll, I'll do the basic thing. Happy birthday, yeah? This is resolve. <laughs> There's the question mark. What Herman would do is Because he doesn't want to re resolve. He can't resolve until it's re he's ready to and the film is ready to. Because when a piece of music resolves, it's telling us that something in the film is resolved itself. Let's have a look at the clip. Thank you, Hamish. Sound up, please. Herman provided the music for Wells's ill-fated follow-up to Citizen Kane, The Magnificent Ambersons, before embarking on a run of diverse and acclaimed scores. But it was more than a decade before he found a similarly brilliant collaborator when he became Alfred Hitchcock's composer of choice. 1958 saw them working on a film whose reputation is now rivaled only by Citizen Kane.
as the greatest American picture ever made. It's in Bernard Herrmann's contrary nature that his most haunting lyrical score and his personal favorite amongst the scores he wrote for Hitchcock should be inspired by a dark, morbid tale in which the hero falls in love with a dead woman. In Vertigo, James Stewart plays a detective who is asked to protect a woman, played by Kim Novak, who believes she's possessed by the spirit of her suicidal ancestor. But this is a film in which nothing is as it seems, and Herman's score reflects this. In one sequence in particular, he pulls off a clever musical double bluff. Stuart has tailed Novak to an art gallery which contains a portrait of her dead ancestor. The music here is eerie and disturbing. But when the scene shifts as Stuart follows Novak to the Golden Gate Bridge, the score also shifts, almost imperceptibly. A tune begins to emerge. By Hitchcock's standards, this is a very long travelling scene, and it's unusual for him, except that, of course, the music's telling us more than we can see. What's happening is that there's a warmth growing in the music, a sense that these two people in their separate cars have got a link. Slowly but surely, James Stewart's compassion for the Kim Novak character is becoming love. The cars arrive at the bridge, and the score too comes to some sort of a rest. But it maintains a neutral, quizzical feel. That jump is a complete shock. The music had done nothing to warn us that was coming, but it goes further. It sounds like the score didn't know she was going to jump. Those high horn arpeggios are screaming for help for someone, preferably James Stewart, to dive in and get her out. Now I had the opportunity to score a Hitchcock film. Hitchcock's last silent film was called Blackmail, and it was released as both silent and sound. The sound version is very, very famous because he used sound as part and parcel of the tension of the mystery. Uh, there's a famous moment where she keeps hearing the word knife, knife, she's killed a man with a knife, 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 knife. But actually the silent blackmail for me is the better film. He'd been making silent films for 12 years. He got already nine or 10 behind him when he came to make blackmail. Sound was sort of forced on him. And in the silent blackmail, we have the same story, but we have it told visually. We have it told in such a way that we get all of our information through silent movie vocabulary. That's basically body language, folks. If you can tell a character from how they look, how they stand, how they move, how they smile, how they look, you don't have to hear them speak. So I want to play you a little moment from blackmail. First of all, mute. I can tell you roughly what's going on. I should give a trigger here as well, because if you don't know, blackmail is about date rape. This is about a girl who's fallen for a man she's not met before. And he's going to take her up to his studio. He's an artist. And we don't know what's going to happen. So can we start the clip mute, please, Hamish? Thank you. So he has offered to paint her. And he's got her to go in, get into a ballet dress, which she loves. She loves the ballet dress anyway. Now, how do you go from two people who barely know each other entering this studio no more than four or five minutes beforehand and getting into this situation? Well, the dress itself has got its own, own theme. It's got its own music. She's had a little bit of a drink. She likes him. She's very impressed with him. He's quite a good looking bloke. And so she's gone ahead, loves the idea of being painted by him, wearing the dress. And she plays up to the dress, and she does this little sort of dance. And everything's fine. She's Cinderella. He's Prince Charming. Until the moment when it changes. And when it changes is now. Because he tries to force himself on her. 
And that kiss just turns into something horrendous, at which she has to get away. Now, what is happening musically is fairly obvious. You've got a road map there. But how you deal with the reality of this situation so that we in 2023 understand a film made in 1929 is about trying to make it as truthful as possible within a genre. And the genre is the Hitchcock mystery drama. It's, it's the music that someone like Herman would have written for Hitchcock. This is just out and out evil. He's taken her dress, she can't put it on. She realizes it. He throws the dress to one side. Now, I saw the original play of this last year, and I had no idea. None of these scenes are there. We hear about these scenes only reported in the play. Hitchcock, as always, makes us voyeurs, makes us watch something, even maybe something we don't want to see. So can we go back to the top of the clip, but can we have the music up for that now then, please, Hamish? Because I want to show you basically why, what I tried to do so that the music transformed this, but didn't move away from what's happening. So here's the dress theme. It's like a waltz from a Cinderella movie. suggest that what had happened had broken the score. So what we have is the sound you might hear in your ears after a really loud noise, like a ringing. It's just tight strings. Just moving a little, not much. It gives us nothing. But she's in a trance state. The shock is so great that to add music to it, apart from this, felt wrong. 
But the score's got to come back in somewhere. And Hitchcock quite often kicks off his music cues with movement or with a cut. Notice how many times in Hitchcock films somebody puts down a cup of tea. Oof, off comes the music. With this, it's her shudder. She's going to go up to get her coat, which is over a painting that he showed her earlier of a jester. she was only defending herself. So it becomes an action movie. And yet it'll never come back as lush as it did when she had that dress. That's intentional. If we're going to feel what is happening in that room, the music has to be able to be as truthful as possible within the limitations of the fact that I'm a 65-year-old man. Us composers, all of us, have to be as open as possible. We have to know what it feels like to feel things. Most composers, for film particularly, or TV, games, whatever, are dramaturges. They get what's needed. They understand at a deep level how people tick, what makes them tick. And that's what they bring to the films. So let's jump genre big time because I want to now look at something completely different where the music is just telling us what we're seeing, but doing it in the most extraordinary way. Animation is still, for me, one of the most fruitful things to get the chance to accompany. The beauty thing, beautiful thing about animation is that it's anything's possible. You don't have to stick in a reality. You can be scoring lines that move, and that's all. And I want to go back a while to my favourite animations and the most extraordinary man who used to be able to create the music for them. This was a guy called Scott Bradley. Scott Bradley scored Tom and Jerry. And what he did was work within the Hollywood system to bring jazz, of course, and classical, and modernist music to fit with animations that were going out as part of a 1940s, 1950s film show. But what you tend to forget is that the music with Tom and Jerry, because it is what they literally call Mickey Mousing, it's actually going doing the same things the characters are doing, is not bound by the normal rules of music. It has to change with the characters. It has to change with whatever's happening next. So Scott Bradley was writing stuff in not just 7, 8, 9, 8, 11, 8, he was writing 16, 12. He was writing every possible uh, cue under the sun. And he was having to record the music live. So in other words, he was actually having to conduct two picture for a section of the film, stop, go back, do it again, until he'd got it as matched as he possibly could. And he would normally put in a held note at the end of that cue to get into the next. So let's have a little bit of Tom and Jerry, and I'll try and talk you through what Scott Bradley's doing while it's happening. Sound up, please, Hamish. Thank you. Go 
we had to use MGM numbers as well, as if they weren't already out of the problem. It's a band of probably no more than about 25. And they are the best musicians in Hollywood. They have to be. They have to be able to read that stuff and produce it right there and then. And no matter how well Scott Bradley could conduct it, he still needed musicians who would be able to get that bum little little within that time. And all of them would have been used to playing modernist music just as much as they would the big standards. Hollywood was a very weird mix of Tin Pan Alley and real serious creative modernism. And the fact that you can see it in films like that still astounds me to this day. Okay, what about horror? As Eddie Izzard once said, why don't a characters in a horror movie listen to the music? <laughs> <laughs> if they did, they wouldn't go down that dark alleyway there, because as soon as they started to do it, you get <laughs> They'd try that one. <laughs> Try that one. Oh, we'll go down there. That's absolutely the truth. What horror film is about and what horror music about is about is putting us on the back foot, making us feel awkward, making us feel like we're not welcome. Could you start the next clip, please? And sometimes, with sound down, yeah? Thanks. Sometimes it's done in such a way that we don't expect it. There's something about sitting in a dark auditorium like this. Would you believe the film we're going to watch has started? In fact, it was a bit of a problem for projectionists at the time because they thought they were just playing Black <coughs> Leader and they cut it off, which meant that the score wouldn't come in until the first 16 bars were over. But what it is, it's making us aware of darkness, of something out there. But instead of giving us scary music, it gives us music that seems to fit somehow or other with the core of the film. Because the film is The Innocence, and it's based on the novel by Henry James called The Turn of the Screw, which is about two young children who have been taken over by the evil ghosts of a housekeeper and a gamekeeper in the house that they live in. It's about 
youth and innocence being corrupted. It's about child, childhood being manipulated, transformed. And when we get into the actual titles of the, new, of the film, we've already been put somewhere that's made us think, that's made us worry. When we sit in front of a film in a cinema for the first time, for the first few seconds, we're just waiting to see what the filmmaker's going to hit us with. Is this the film we paid to see? Is this the film we saw on the poster? This is a feeling you can't get at home with video because the lights are up and we sit and watch it on a big screen. But you can get it here. Can we go back to the top, please, Hamish, and play it with the sound up? This is what we have. We lay, my love and I, beneath a weeping willow, but now alone I lie, and weep beside the tree, singing scratching on the tent in the Blair Witch Project. Then a bird, sounding like a beautiful sunny day. We're still in darkness. We've still been given no visual information whatsoever. discovers the awful things going on in this house. And so we dropped in, not to the beginning of the story, but to the end of it. All I want to do is save the children, not destroy them. And still that bird. This is a massive hook, folks. It's I hooking us into the film. We want to know why. Anything. And the music doesn't tell us. They need affection, love, someone who will belong to them, and to whom they will belong. And then we go to the flashback and we start the film. But that means that that film can be as normal as you like. It can give us stuff that looks completely innocent. It's full of beautiful landscapes. The house seems gorgeous. She seems to be very much in control of things. But we've already seen her not in control. And we've already heard that voice sing. So what that's done is prepare our heads for what this film's going to do. And in such a way that you're not going to forget that over. It is going to inform everything she does and everything the film does from then on through. That opening few seconds, how much information we take on board 
As soon as you hear anything or see anything, you start to try and make sense of it in your head. Can we have the next clip, please, Hamish? Sound up. This, for me, is one of the most exciting openings of any film, once you get past the studio logo, that is. Sound up, please. Those first two sounds are gut punches. And in cinemas that only recently got sense around in them, those bass speakers really, really respond. What it felt like to me was that I was about to be brought into a world in which human beings no longer had any kind of control. This was a machine world in which humans don't do any well. the isolation of that crushed ship. And yet, Vangelis then turns it on a six point, turns it into something completely different.
but he's also given us something phenomenal. And that music is all positive at that point. That was an incredible thrill ride when I first saw it in the 1980s, that first few minutes where you were taken from a world that was too scary to even have any music in it, just two big punches to the gut. And then amazing visuals, amazing music. It's setting people's minds in the right space before they see the film. And that's what I try to do with a genre which I love, but it's actually quite hard to score for because it's a mix, it's a mashup. We're getting more and more mashups now, and I love them. I love it when a filmmaker decides, yeah, I'm going to make a horror rom-com. Something that's already got two is issues to it that you love anyway, but just makes them do that. Way, way back in the late 1920s, somebody came up with the idea of the comedy horror. Comedy horror, I think, for me anyway, is a beautiful mix of two things that I find absolutely fascinating. And I have to say, scoring comedy is hard. Scoring comedy is almost as hard as doing comedy. You cannot afford to do music that goes, hey, this is funny, isn't it? Isn't this funny? This is really funny, this film. This is really, really funny. Oh, there's a really funny bit coming up. <coughs> because the music will kill it stone dead. But with comedy horror, you can push the horror, but just give it a little bit of an edge. There's a little snigger going on at the same time. This is a film called The Cat and the Canary. And in fact, don't show it with the, just show it with the sound up, please, uh, Hamish. And I hope you'll get what I mean. Cat and the Canary doesn't take itself in the least bit seriously. And so the music has to also be kind of a game. Thanks, Hamish. Let it go, please. Turn it up a little bit if you can. Thank you. Isolation again. The music telling us something, not a lot. example of a director who can just show rather than tell. This is German expressionism brought through a Hollywood lens into comedy horror. Killer. So I made the cat 
the sound of the theremin. Relatives are gathering for the reading of that will. Once again, what I've tried to do is get people into the mood to both laugh at and be scared by what they're going to see. The film does it brilliantly. The music just has to try and keep up. And again, as you heard there, a lot of the music was not resolving, except when it did resolve, it somehow or other took the sting out of what we were watching. As soon as you had any major key, for instance, that made it a different experience. <laughs> I'd like to score it again now because that was 20 years ago and I think I could probably do it better. But there is something about being able to compose for films where there isn't an absolute score. Silent Film was able to teach me, and still does I think to all of us, that it's a blank sheet of paper. My score for that film would be different to your score, to your score, to your score, to your score. And it would make it all those different films. That is, I think, part of one of the things that you have to take on board as a composer, is that this is your take. This is what you personally feel. The fact that I loved that genre made it a big difference. I was inspired. But I was also trying to think, as far as I could, what a truthful response would be to what I was watching. And then try to get that into the music. There are times when you just kind of chuck something at it that feels right. And there are times when all the music needs to do is to maintain the heartbeat, if you like. Let's look at a modern, or at least a more modern, action sequence and the way it's scored. John Powell is responsible for this. He's, for me, one of the greatest film composers we now have living. And he has the most extraordinary ear and eye. But all he's really got to do with this sequence is to make what feels like jumbled shots into something homogeneous, something that moves. Something which is also, in itself, incredibly upfront, but leaves space for the dialogue, for things to move, for things to change. Can we have the next clip, please? Thanks very much, Hamish. Sound up. This is from The Born Identity. <laughs> Was the last known position, please. Uh, on the walkway heading towards the concourse, sir. Surveillance nightmare. It's the busiest terminal in London. Give me all of CCTV's eyes. On it, sir. Sir, assets on What's your source's name? Look, what's going on? Why are these people after me? Because you found something. You talked to someone inside Treadstone, someone who was there at the beginning. Who is it? You know I can't tell you that. You have no idea what you're into here. These people will kill you if they have to. Was it Blackbriar? Is that what this is? Black, what's Blackbriar? Treadstone upgrade. My source told me it all started with you. He said that you were square one, the dirty little secret. He said he knows who you are. Right, we have to move. Skype same Answer your phone. You got a visual? Where the hell is he, people? Now the strings are taken. Do exactly as I said. You need to move up to your right. First escalator on the right. Tie your shoe, tie your shoe. 
right now. Tire ship. Oh, shit. I want you to move along the far wall to your left. In four, three, two, one, stand up. That's it. He's gone. Where the hell is he? We cannot afford to lose this guy, people. All right, that line you're on is good. Stay on that line. Stay on that line. Oh, the bit man, I think he's one of them. Yeah, Garbage man? Negative. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, he's reaching for something. Oh, God, Stay he's got a gun. He's got a gun. Stay it on the line, you're he's on. Got a gun. Do not deviate. Okay, there here he is. Goes. Here he goes. Tell grab team A, go. He's still talking with somebody. He's getting instructions. Jimmy, give me the conversation. Lock the box. Lock the box. Moving grab team C. Hurry, Ross. We gotta move. Okay, move through this crowd. Move through this crowd. Get undercover right now. Move through this crowd. Get in the store. There's someone on your tail. Get in the store. We're gonna proceed out the east exit. That's to your right as you come into the store. Head into the liquor store in front of you. Go into the back and lock the door. Mobile force is down. This guy's got help. Tell me when the asset's in the nest. That kind of high octane scene is maintained as much by the music as it is by the visual. And the other thing that it's doing is it's binding together those two separate scenes, the scenes of the CIA people watching what's going on and what's actually happening in Waterloo. But within it are tiny gradations of change, just enough to make the difference to us as we're watching. We're held, absolutely. And there's such a mix of sounds in there, but he just chooses the moment at which to bring forward the drums, the moment at which to bring forward the strings, the moment at which to bring forth anything other than percussive forward movement. That, to me, I think, has sort of got out of hand. There's a lot of just ba 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 goes through a lot of action movies. John Powell's different. Powell's got it. He sort of understands. He's also got that ability to make us feel something for Jason Bourne, who is basically a machine. And music often does give us character. Clint Eastwood in the, uh, the Dollars movies, Clint Eastwood in the first film he had, had about 38 lines. That was it. We didn't know anything about Clint Eastwood. We didn't know anything about his character. But as soon as you hear that music creeping in behind him, which seems to be suggestive of an amazing past, an amazing man, or something he's lost, something he's grieving for, then we're on Clint Eastwood's side. That's entirely down to Ennio Morricone giving us Clint Eastwood's character. That's down to John Powell taking us further into the situation and giving us more information about it. So I want to play one last piece of film with some music I've written for it, which is, again, trying to establish a mood and a genre and this time I am going to try and score it so that it does do what it also does what the, the visuals are doing I am for once trying to get the music to just do what we can see but there's a reason for that when Errol Flynn made Robin Hood in the 1930s he had the great Eric, Gaw Eric Korngold scoring for him and Korngold brought to Robin Hood an aesthetic that was sort of operatic but it was also dance he choreographed the action sequences so when I got a chance to score the Robin Hood that Douglas Fairbanks made in 1922 for the BBC Symphony Orchestra, I did the same trick, or tried to. I made it as truthful as I could until the action started, and then I turned everything into dance as far as possible. This is Robin Hood. This is Prince John, evil, nasty villain, about to meet Robin for the first time. Thanks, Hamish. Let's have the sound up, please. <coughs> John's theme. Talk 
tolling bell. Somehow or other seems medieval, I don't know why. This is absolutely dark deeds afoot. Again, not take it too seriously, but do something that feels right with the film and to have a good time with it. And I think there is something joyous about that kind of movie. The most joyous thing for me was that the BBC Symphony Orchestra is one of the few orchestras in the world that's actually salaried. So they're paid by the BBC whether they play or not. So I said, how many musicians have I got? And I said, well, you've got to use them all. <laughs> said, all right, fine. How many is that? 83. Now, the chances of being able to work with an orchestra that size happened in, in Hollywood all the time. It doesn't happen very often now. 
But that, again, that sense of being able to take all that sound and all those different textures and make them work with the film was a wonderful opportunity. So I want to finish just by going right the way back to the piano and back to a film which I've played a lot. It's one of the greatest movies made in the silent period. It's a B-movie, would you believe? It's not even considered one of the great releases of all time. It has got one of the greatest actresses in it, Louise Brooks. But it's a movie made at right at the end of the 20s and deals with a situation which we recognize from the 1930s in the Depression, which is the idea of hobos riding the rails. It's called Beggars of Life. And in it, we are presented, it's William Wellman, who is a truly great director. We're presented with a whole load of information very, very early on. And it takes us into the story, but it also starts to give us all the gradations of emotion and change that we can see within those characters. So I'm going to play <clears throat> and try and talk through what I'm doing while it's happening. And we're going to see from the opening shot of the film. Bring that up, please, if you would, Hamish. And it can be mute, that's absolutely fine. We start with just a pair of feet walking along a path. But it's America, it's Americana, so I would try to give it that feel. teeth and run it on.
about running.
piece of opening film making that is almost second to none. We know so much about these people. By the time we get to there, we care about them. We want to know what happens to them. We want to know how far she is going to be willing to go to escape from the police and how far he's going to be willing to go to help her, help, help her do it. It's a great movie. It's one that I've played a lot with the Dodge Brothers, which is the skiffle band that uh, Mark Kermode plays bass in. But I still think it's one of the great silent films. And as I say, silent films have taught me a lot about how music works with film.